This is the New Revolution Element 3 Part 1, and here we're going to talk about the year 1968, which may have been one of the worst years in American history. Now, the 1960s were very difficult at home, and they were very difficult abroad as well, but 1968 really marks a turning point in the whole process, both in Vietnam and at home. And it really starts with what you see in front of you here, the Tet Offensive. Now, in the Vietnam War, both sides, North Vietnamese Communists and South Vietnamese, who were trying to defend against the Communists, uh, were Buddhist, and therefore both sides celebrated the Buddhist holiday of Tet. Typically, every year, they did a ceasefire, a temporary one, to celebrate the holiday. Well, in 1968, the South agreed to that ceasefire, but the Northern Communists attacked, and this picture you see here is of American troops defending themselves against the North Vietnamese attacking the southern capital of Saigon. Now, this didn't win the war for the North, but there were cameras there, and it did create a problem back home because the Tet Offensive showed the nation that we might actually be losing the Vietnam War. Uh, and we had been told to that point by the media and the government that we were doing really well. So, we'll do more on this in the Foreign Policy Unit, but I want you to understand the effect the Tet Offensive had on people at home, both in attitudes about the war and how it changed the draft. See, the key here once again is the year 1968. Prior to the Tet Offensive, if you got drafted to go to Vietnam, you went there with the full intention of winning the war. I mean, that's what the American military had always done, except for the War of 1812, really. Uh, they had always gone in and won wars. And so this wasn't going to be any different. You got drafted, you went there with the intention of winning the war and maintaining military discipline. That's why you don't see a lot of facial hair or long hair on these guys, because that was part of military discipline. But after the Tet Offensive of 1968, we started to see a changing trend in the American military in Vietnam. Now, before we go any farther, let's make two things perfectly clear. First of all, Soldiers are willing to do things that the rest of us are not willing to do, and therefore should be shown the proper respect and appreciation for that. Secondly, I don't want to suggest that soldiers after 1968 as a whole had given up on the war. There were still plenty of soldiers over there trying to maintain military discipline, trying to win the war, uh, etc. But you did start seeing a trend that was impossible to deny, and that was the fact that military discipline was starting to erode a bit. Uh, you have to remember that soldiers went over there to do essentially around one year tours of duty before they could come home. And a lot of soldiers drafted after 1968 had already been participating in anti-war protests back home for three years. So Vietnam soldiers after 68 started appearing with longer hair and facial hair. You started seeing soldiers with peace symbols on their helmets and phrases like war is hell written on the helmet or carrying a pack of cigarettes or wearing a, a beard or a mustache or long hair. Uh, these were things that traditionally you hadn't seen in the American military. And given that a lot of the soldiers being drafted after 68 had been protesting the war at home already, it started pointing to this idea that maybe discipline was starting to lack with some of the troops. Not all, but some. It also didn't help soldier morale when Vietnam was being referred to as the poor man's war or the minority war. Remember that if you were going to college during the Vietnam era, you were exempted from the draft. And also remember that in the 1950s, the white flight had led whites out of the cities and into the suburbs. Uh, suburbs flourished with a lot of economic advantages during that time and the ability to send their kids to college. Whereas poor whites or uh, minorities in the inner cities didn't always have those same economic advantages. If you didn't want to go to college, if you just want to enter the, enter the workforce, or if you couldn't afford to go to college, you were the one that was getting drafted to go into the Vietnam War. And it left a lot of people over there wondering why they had to shoulder the load for everybody when the more affluent ones could stay at home. As a result, you started seeing some of the troops changing their view about being in Vietnam. I mean, the average tour of duty might be around a year, so a lot of people were just kind of waiting for their time in Vietnam to end. Uh, there were uh, many veterans who were likening it to a prison experience, 
And a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them were just looking at their calendars and checking off the days until they could essentially be set free from their tour of duty. Now again, many were there doing everything they could to try to win the war, but there was a growing contingent that was trying to just survive and go home. And around 1968, we started to see the development of two trends that had never been seen in the American military before, fragging and drug use. Now, fragging is when you kill your commander, usually through the use of a fragmentation grenade, but, you know, uh, killing your commander in a field with a gun would also qualify as a definition of fragging. It's just the idea of killing your commander. Uh, The reason you would do that is, well, let's say you're a veteran who's been there for eight months of your tour. There are certain places you don't go because you've seen what happens there when you do. And let's say some guy fresh out of officer's training school comes in and tells you you're going there. Well, you frag the commander and no more problem. Uh, Also, we started to see heroin and LSD and marijuana become bigger problems uh, after 1968 in Vietnam. It all kind of fed into this idea of just lack of discipline and not wanting to be there. Now, if you're President Lyndon Johnson in this situation, this can't be easy. You've got a nation that is coming apart at the seams, a lot of protests, a big divide between the conservatives and the liberals, uh, and over in Vietnam, it's not necessarily going well either because uh, you know, you've got declining discipline in the ranks, and it's becoming fairly obvious to people that the war is not going as well as you've been telling people that the war is going. So by the time we get to uh, the spring and summer of 1968, actually the spring, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, has decided he's had enough. And so despite the fact that there's an election coming up in November of 1968, and that Johnson has only served one term, remember he finished out the last year of Kennedy's term, so He's still eligible for one more term if he wants one. He decides that he's not going to run for president again, that the Democrats will have to choose someone else to be their nominee in the November election. Now, think about this for a second if you're a Vietnam soldier and how how this would make you feel. Uh, The commander-in-chief of all military forces in Vietnam was quitting before the war was over. And if the commander-in-chief is quitting before the war is done, then what are you still doing there? This, of course, did not help with uh, already declining morale in Vietnam after the Tet Offensive. And, you know, when you factor in the discipline issues that were starting to erode a bit and the fact that your commander-in-chief was quitting, it's easy to see why not all guys, but a lot of the guys that were over there were looking to just survive and get out. But really, what was happening in Vietnam and what was happening with Lyndon Johnson were just the beginnings of the problems of 1968. In April of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis. King, as you can see lying here on this balcony where he was shot, as people are trying to point out the gunman, uh, King had been in Memphis to uh, give a speech to sanitation workers, and actually... At that speech the night before, in a sense, had predicted his own death. He had said, I may not get to the top of the mountain uh, with you, but we as a people will get to the top of the mountain someday. And the next day, he was dead. It was this man, James Earl Ray, who was accused of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And for obvious reasons, Ray became one of the most hated men in America pretty much right off the bat. But there are still lingering doubts even to this day about whether or not James Earl Ray actually killed Martin Luther King. In fact, Martin Luther King's family has come out and said that they don't believe that James Earl Ray was the assassin. Uh, Ray had professed his innocence till the time of his death, and we still don't know to this day if he really did it or not. But regardless, the fact remained that Martin Luther King Jr. was dead, and while some white supremacists were happy about that, Uh, It obviously created a huge divide in the country. Uh, African Americans were now uh, very upset. Uh, White supremacists were happy. And it added one more thing that kind of tore the fabric of America apart during that time. And this was in the spring. This was in April of 1968. So the year was 
already off to a really bad start between Vietnam and the assassination of Martin Luther King. And then, almost inexplicably, the situation got worse. Remember that Lyndon Johnson had said that he was not going to run for president again in the November 1968 election. So the Democrats needed to find a new candidate, and they ran a series of primary elections among a bunch of Democrats to decide which one of those Democrats was going to be their nominee. Well, Hubert H. Humphrey had won some primary elections, as they were called in various states, and George McGovern was making some inroads as well. But coming on strong was Robert F. Kennedy, the younger brother of John F. Kennedy. Now, Bobby Kennedy had been the attorney general for uh, John F. Kennedy back when he was in office, and, and again was coming on strong as a potential Democratic nominee for president in 1968. But after winning the California primary, Bobby Kennedy was shot in the head, just like his older brother had been back in 1963. He was struggling to survive at first, but it was obvious that he wasn't going to make it. The man who shot him was this guy right here, Sirhan Sirhan. Kennedy had been giving his speech and holding his victory party in a hotel, and was actually done with the speech, thanking everyone, and was ducking out a back entrance of the hotel through a kitchen, when this guy just jumped out and shot him. Now, this assassination took place in June of 1968, uh, and it may have been the event that, in terms of despair and anxiety, took the nation over the top for that year. Bobby Kennedy was shot in the head and assassinated, just like his beloved older brother had been shot in the head and assassinated only five years earlier. And when you factor this in with the fact that we have the Tet Offensive that is creating doubt in the war, and people getting drafted in the war that may not want to be there, and the assassination of Martin Luther King that already took place in April of 1968, by the time you get to June and Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated, we're not even halfway through the year fully yet, and already it's been one of the worst years in American history. And it also has to make you stop and take a look at the 1960s as one of the most anxiety-ridden decades in American history overall, not just the year 1968, when you consider that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated in 1963, civil rights leader Malcolm X had been assassinated in 1965, Martin Luther King had been assassinated in April of 1968, and now with the assassination of Bobby Kennedy in June of 1968, that's four major American cultural figures assassinated in five years. I can't think of another time period in American history where that's taken place. I mean, think about that now. If we had one assassination in the modern day, what that would do to the country. Whether you like the person or not, if a major leader gets assassinated, it has a anxiety-ridden cultural ripple effect through the nation. Imagine if that happened to four people in five years in modern America. And then, by the late summer, there were even more problems as the nation was coming apart in 1968. By the time you got to the Democratic National Convention, where they were supposed to announce who their nominee was going to be for president, protest riots started happening outside of the convention hall. Now, this was in Chicago, Illinois, in 1968. As a result, the police were called out, and many of the protesters were beaten and tear-gassed, and also arrested. Uh, but it wasn't like the police were out of danger either. There were a lot of police that were getting attacked by mobs during that time, while inside at the Democratic National Convention, they were trying to figure out who the guy was going to be that was going to run for president for the Democrats now that Lyndon Johnson was no longer their candidate. All in all, by the time you get to August of 1968, it's already been one of the worst years in American history. In fact, in terms of major events of 1968, there's really only one thing, as far as I'm concerned, that went right. The Apollo 8 mission on Christmas Eve 1968 circled the moon and got us this cool picture right here called the Earth Rise, as opposed to a sunrise or a moonrise. Uh, no space mission in history at that point, whether it be American or Soviet, had taken place outside of the Earth's atmosphere, so this was a large leap ahead of the Soviets in the space race. So, there was that. Well, that and the fact that the Tigers won the series that year, so, I don't know, maybe 1968 wasn't so bad. <laughs> 
Anyway, that's it. Thanks for listening.